I am Jason Rossum, Director of Programs at the uh, Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. Uh, Ashland University is, uh, uh, the Ashbrook Center is an independent center at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. Uh, we're dedicated to teaching teachers, students, and citizens about our responsi responsibilities to maintain constitutional self-government. Uh, one of our key outreaches to that audience is a website at teachingamericanhistory.org where we have about 2,500 primary sources available for free uh, to citizens, and we have uh, online exhibits, four online exhibits, um, including uh, uh, one that we'll be discussing today on the Constitutional Convention. Um, our uh, partner in those online exhibits is Professor Gordon Lloyd. He is Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. Um, he uh, has, has partnered with us in the creation of these four online exhibits, including this exhibit on the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we've had over 300,000 visitors uh, to that uh, website over the last year. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, other than James Madison, uh, nobody has had more influence in introducing Americans to the uh, conversation about self-government than our speaker today, Professor Gordon Lloyd. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here to see some new faces and some old faces. No, I mean, uh, faces I've seen before. <laughs> you asked me to be sweet to you today. I did. Well, and I was. And <laughs> the various generations are, are here. Um, um, Judy McGonaghy from, from when I was at University of Redlands, um, Alex from, from Pepperdine, and from uh, uh, the A. The, the Ashbrook Center program, so uh, Kathy's here. Um, what I want to do is not only challenge James Madison, but challenge Wikipedia, whom I think is a greater challenge because Wikipedia is, a, is, a, is around. And uh, if we were to type in Google the American founding, we will discover uh, 145 million results, and we're number one ahead of Wikipedia. And I look upon that as quite an accomplishment because students will then listen to me, or at least view what I have to say with a greater amount of alarm or interest. So if we were to click on the American founding, you will see that um, there are four sites within one here. The first one is the Constitutional Convention, which is what we're going to spend time on today. The Federalist, Anti-Federalist debates are uh, the out-of-doors debate over whether or not to ratify the Constitution, which took place in newspapers. We could look at that, but at another time. The ratification of the Constitution, that is the indoors debate that took place in the 13 states where <laughs> delegates were especially selected to answer one question. Shall we ratify or not ratify this Constitution? And it's a fascinating debate that took place over a couple of years. Um, the press was there. People were in the, in, in the galleries yelling and booing. And people, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was democracy at work. And, um, in a far different democracy at work than at the Constitutional Convention. You know, there's, there's a time to talk and listen and devise, and there's a talk to, uh, there's a time to implement. And I would think that the Constitution Convention is when we devise, come up with a plan. The Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate is where we debate the plan in the newspapers and letters. This is where we decide what to do about the plan, yay or nay. And the final one is the Bill of Rights, where, which is the conclusion to this early narrative where the Bill of Rights is added, as, uh, which is an interesting thing rather than incorporated. But that, too, is beyond the scope of today, which is Constitution Week. And I'm going to focus on the creation of the Constitution and the signing of the Constitution. The, but these, I, I like to think about it as a four-part story, and you can cut into it. What I like about, if I might say so, is that, is, is that it emphasizes two basic ways to, to try to get to know your framers. One is a visual way, through paintings and the work of artists 
and tables, et cetera, that help people visualize what is going on. A lot of us are more visual. And then there's the textual way, the actual text of documents, et cetera. And that you, I am taught, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm gonna have to date you in some ways. It, it, I mean, I've been teaching since I was 23 in college. And over the years, what I've learned is that there is no one general theory of education. We all come to learn in different times and at different places. And my job is to try to produce a number of avenues in which you and your students, and my betters, you don't know exactly which, which day a student comes to you and says, do you remember Miss such and such and such the day? And you have, if you're very honest about it, you say, no, I don't. But you keep plugging away because you know somewhere along the line, some student is going to hopefully turn around or, or see the light. Or, so that, that's my objective, is not to present one way, but basically textual ways and visual ways. If we now go to the Constitution <coughs> Convention, which is going to be what we're going to be looking at today, and I, I, I promise you, you're here for Act 1, but if you leave before Act 4, you won't know how it ends. <laughs> You just have to wonder whether the Constitution was ever signed on September the 17th. And I, and I hate for you to miss the ending. <laughs> um, this site <clears throat> uh, has an introduction to the site, and, and in there you will also find an introduction to why they were there and how the delegates were selected. Um, and also introducing you to something which I think is extremely important, known as quorum requirements. Um, quorum requirements are where each state sets a, a rule which so many delegates have to be in attendance before that state can cast a vote. Now we see we're already starting to get complicated. Um, how do you understand the Constitutional Convention? Well, you've got to pay attention to detail. And there are two ways to pay attention to detail. One is to try to figure out what's happening on a day-by-day -day basis. And another way is to try to serialize the events, like you're having it's a four-part something or the other. And it, it's, it's sort of arbitrary when you break it down into its various parts, but you still have to do that. Otherwise, you lose control of the material. This becomes a sort of a, a wad of words and you, you don't know what is going on. But one important element is the quorum requirement. So some, some days you're going through the, the debates and you discover, well, New Jersey isn't voting. And you know, why not? Or New York isn't voting. Or somebody speaks from, from Connecticut, but Connecticut isn't voting. And you begin to worry and think, I'm giving up. But if you understand the quorum requirements so that people are coming back and forth some are staying all the time, but some are coming back and forth. Uh, that helps you to understand the dynamic of the convention. In this section the, of, of, of the convention, is, which is the, the second one, the convention in this section, we will see the Constitutional Convention as a four-act drama, day-by-day -day summary and Madison's notes. That is what we're going to focus on today, those. But just to show you what else is available, the delegates, if you want, some, some, some people get in touch with the event or the uh, action by knowing more about the actual people themselves who are there. And this gives you a complete list of the educational background, the age of the delegates, occupation of the delegates, the continental experience, so you can go all, you can understand somehow their background. A lot of people approach the text by, by way of understanding who these people are and their backgrounds. Resources in the convention. This took me over 25 years to put together and I'm still working on it. it it's the at convention attendance record. And it's a day-by-day -day account of who was there and who wasn't there, who was probably there and who wasn't probably there. And I, I started that at Redlands and um, I, uh, I'm still working on it, but if you want to just, if you, if you just click on the convention attendance record uh, for a moment, just click that one on, you will s and uh, come, say, enter the attendance record, uh, click that on, then what you should have 
Uh, so if we were, do, see, and it's linked to the four act drama which we're doing today. And you say, I want to know who was there on May the 29th. So you click on May the 29th up at the top. Yeah, click that on. You, you, well, I think you have to pull it. Pull, pull it. That's, that shows how much I know about technology. You pull it. Yeah, you click on May the 29th up there on, on, on the arrow. And it shows, you, it shows you who is there and who is not there. It can help you avoid a lot of mistakes in terms of, well, if Alexander Hamilton was really interested in such and such, he'd have spoken up. Well, he can hardly speak up when he's 100 miles away. <laughs> Things like that. And you can come up with some very, very interesting correlations between the age of the delegates, the proximity. So it's not just do you come from a small state or a large state. Are you a slave owner or not a slave owner? Do you come from the north or do you come from the south? Are you in your 30s or are you in your 50s? It's, it's a complicated way of, of, of approach. It's a, it's a simple way of trying to approach a very complicated dynamic. Namely, this is a conversation. All previous foundings are by one person. Solon, Moses, Theseus. You don't have to have a conversation. This is the first founding ever in which you have to have a conversation by people who were elected. And then they sit around and they talk for 88 days. And they have to listen to each other and tolerate each other. And they come up with something that they can agree to. In the end, three didn't agree to it. Some left early. But that's the, the, we are getting introduced to the messy work of what it means to, not just to put a bill together, but a constitution together. Nation building and constitution building is not just writing a word on a paper. What's, what's behind those words and how did those words come? To, what other words could they have chosen rather than the words that are there? And how do you, how do you capture that story? Well, what I'm through all of these alternative ways. So today, we're going to focus on the four act drama. So if we were to start off with act one, excuse me, what happens that when I start teaching and boring myself, I get allergies. Uh, so, so if we were to go back to the four act drama, yeah, in, in this section, in the convention, go to the four act drama, what I've done is to break it down into component parts. Uh, so act one is the alternative plans. Act two is the Connecticut Compromise. That's what we're going to do this morning. Then there's lunch. And after lunch, we will, you see, that will be the intermission. And he said, Lloyd, you're really going too far now. You're really stretching this. But there was an intermission. At the end of Act Two, a committee was created, a five-member committee was created to come up with a draft of the Constitution. So people left, went fishing, did other things, while this committee went to work. With that intermission, you get a different tone. Act One and Act Two, there's a lot of talk. People changing their minds or thinking through, where do I take a stand? Do I compromise? Do I, do I push the envelope? What do I do? A decision is made near the end of July that we've done enough talking. Committee on the whole, like a faculty meeting. <laughs> now it's time to do something about it. So you create a subcommittee. And when you create a subcommittee, you know that you're giving them a certain privileged position. Uh, you're not giving them a rubber stamp because they have to come back to you. But at the same time, you're saying, these people whom we have selected have a privileged position in the sense of they are supposed to listen, digest, put it together, and present it to us. And so the burden now shifts. What's, what do we disagree with? And so Act 3 and Act 4 is sort of revising what these, the, 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 the committee over the intermission came up with. What is it that we say, that's fine, that's fine. What is it that we say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, you've got to stop and talk, talk about this more. So Act 1 and Act 2, Committee and the Whole, chatting. Act 3 and Act 4 is revising and coming up with an actual document. So the Constitution emerges at the end as, uh, as a result of conversations which have taken place over 88 days. Act 1, I have divided into 
nine scenes. You could do it in 12 scenes. That's my edit. Madison and the others don't say, all right, folks, this morning we're going to do scene one. <laughs> okay? Um, it's just a pedagogical way of trying to organize the material in such a way that it makes sense. Scene one, laying down the rules. And I used to, like many, many folks who studied the convention, sort of skip over that. Um, Let's get to the real meat and potatoes. Let's get to the real issue. Because laying down the rules, what the heck is that all about? But the, the, the longer I've spent with this material, the more I realize that conversations just don't take place. There's, there's got to be some agreement about how to proceed. We're not just talking about don't pick your teeth in public. We're talking about... Okay. Yeah. At least make a pretension that you're listening. You know, turn off your cell phones. I mean, they were very adamant about that, <laughs> to, turn off your, to turn off your cell phones. Uh, don't write love letters to each other or something like that. See you after class. Uh, you know, don't bring in the newspaper and start reading the newspapers if it's more important than hearing what Mr. Gorham has to say. Uh, you, don't dominate the conversation in such a way that you become a pain, and people don't want to listen to you anymore. Uh, all those kinds of little, you're much too sensitive. You're much too sensitive. I'm just looking across the crowd to relate, and now you, you think I'm talking to you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm criticizing you already. No, no, that comes later. <laughs> so that, that there are certain rules of civility that are important for a conversation to take place. It just doesn't happen. And <clears throat> One of the rules, the most controversial of all the rules, it's, well, it wasn't controversial at the time, but be, has become controversial as people have interpreted and reinterpreted the founding, is what is known as the confidentiality rule, which in different hands becomes known as the secrecy rule. And the secrecy rule in 20th and 21st century democracy has a certain naughty meaning, that is, um, you're hiding things, you're not transparent. If you do things in secret, you're obviously all the better to shaft you, my dear. It's, 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 it, 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 it's darkness, it, it shows the shadows rather than the light. Make everything in the light and, 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 and therefore we, we, we are going to be free because it's, because it's light. And um, we do that a lot of times on retreats. You know, that kind of nonsense where people go and get to know each other, where they leave everything behind and they, they can't, have, can't have their computers and we're all bond. This is known as bondage. And, 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 you, and you go, you, you, know, you have these stupid little games where you put a blindfold on and then you lay back and say, I trust you. Catch me. <laughs> the framers had a much easier answer. Close the windows. <laughs> let's, let's create group solidarity without group think. That is, we want to, quote, to have a team without these nonsensical understandings of, of we are family, which is let's create, let's create a team whereby we can talk frankly with each other, without getting upset, speak our minds, and at the same time, don't try to produce consensus or total agreement at the end, like some kind of Rousseau's general will. And the proof that it worked is that three people in the end didn't sign. So that you created the atmosphere for open conversation, at the same time not requiring people to agree with what you said and that you don't kill them. You don't tar and feather them. You say, fine, just face election and I'll, I'll make sure you don't win. <laughs> or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, which is a much more civilized way of doing it. So the case in favor of closing the windows is it's time to be private. We're in executive session. We're here to talk. But if you think automatically that closing the windows going into executive session, 
automatically means something conspiratorial is taking place. You're never going to give these guys a chance. The time to, to open up the galleries, the time to do all of that comes in ratification. And the world has never seen before the pamphlet wars, the pamphlet exchanges, the, the, the tavern talks, the, all up and down the country for, for two years. That's where you get the exchanges of, quote, the ordinary people, um, uh, rather than the deliberation which takes place. Um, and by any way, politics loves darkness. Um, and, 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 and so you've got to have, you've got to have a certain degree of privacy. It, scene two is the 15 resolutions of the Virginia plan, which is Madison's plan. And it comes from Virginia. I mean, there really is two, there are really two interesting states. Uh, well, there are a number, but for our purposes at the moment, there are two. Massachusetts is extremely important because it's, sort of the mother or the father or the parent, whatever you want to call it, of, of, of the revolution. And uh, John Adams, sure, Jefferson is there from Virginia. But the events in Massachusetts and the whole movement for Massachusetts made, it, made the revolution continental. It started up in Massachusetts. The movement to have a revision of constitutionalism rather than revolutionism came from Virginia. So you've got this very interesting dynamic at work that any constitution which emerges without the support of Massachusetts and Virginia is going to be very, very difficult. It's not that the other 11 states, and I don't mean this at all, but it's not that the other 11 states don't matter. But, if you, you, but you need to anchor it in Massachusetts and Virginia. And Virginia is the largest state. And Massachusetts is not far behind. But it's not just the question of the size, because there are small people from large states, and there are large people from small states. It's, can you do the continental, <coughs> rather than do you just do the sort of the waltz at home? Can you do the big picture? Uh, <coughs> Madison, through Governor Randolph, introduces 15 resolutions of the Virginia plan. And if we click on scene two at the side, we will see the 15 resolutions, a summary of the 15 resolutions. May the 29th, the Virginia plan is introduced and defended by Randolph. If we click that, click that, yep. Um, Matt, and we can go, the, uh, Madison's notes of the debate shows the, shows the entire document. So that, I mean, ultimately what I want to do with you is to, is to get, to Madison's notes so that Madison can talk with you and you can talk with Madison. But how do you get there? Visually, textually, because I don't think you'll just go there. I think you'll shut the book after, the, after day one. <laughs> and this goes through what, what, what the plan is. And as you can see, it, number, um, number one, number two, then proceed to, to enumerate the defects. All right, if we keep going, keep going. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and here, here are the resolutions. Among the resolutions which are very important is that Madison is outlining a frame of government. That is, he's talking about a legislative branch, an executive branch, <clears throat> a judicial branch. That is the structure. Because before, the, um, before this Virginia plan uh, uh, was initiated by Madison, uh, the continental arrangement was the Articles of Confederation, which wasn't a government at all. It was a league, an alliance between pre-existing states. So if you wanted to see government, you would go to the each state level. There you would find voting requirements, the powers of the legislature, how long the executive would, uh, would, uh, would serve, who elected the executive, is there a judiciary, uh, how do you amend the Constitution, you go to into each single state. That's where government was. The Articles was sort of an alliance for general welfare and common defense purposes in which each state was represented equally, regardless of the size of population. So we can go into the argument about why this was deemed to be a defect, but these delegates are at the convention because something wasn't working under the Articles of Confederation. So we need to either revise 
or reform or radicalize that government? What, well, what shall we come up with? And so Madison leads with the Virginia proposal. And the Virginia proposal is we virtually scrap the Articles of Confederation and we create a continental government which models itself on what each state government is doing. So we scrap this idea of NATO or a League of Nations and we try to create a continental government. Is such a government possible on such a large scale? Never done before. Unless it becomes militaristic, unless you give up freedom, that becomes the issue. How large and how complicated shall this new arrangement be? Madison says, as far as reasonable. And so he has these three branches, and he has the House elected by the people. He has the Senate, in effect, proportional representation. Uh, the, the executive at this stage is still in embryo form. Let the House and the Senate do the electing of the president. And I'm willing to go quite far enough and let, let the president have an independent source of, of authority. Have a judiciary. That's the structure. How about the powers of this government? So we've seen a structural change. The structural change is three branches instead of one. The structural change is that people are going to be represented instead of states. That's the structural change. The powers change is that under the Articles, the government uh, could only do those things which were expressly stated. So you look at the document and you see there are 10 things. If what you want to do isn't specifically listed, you can't do it. So that the Articles of Confederation were a restraining document. You can only do that which is stated. In other words, you don't need a Bill of Rights under the Articles of Confederation because the very document itself limits government. But that's part of the problem, says Madison. We, can, we should be able to do more for the continent than what the Articles permits us to do. Well, then amend the document. And every time you try to amend the document, you have to face the following. That it requires unanimous consent of those, of those states who join. Well, how are you going to get unanimous consent? You won't. Rhode Island will always vote no. <laughs> Which means that you're up against it. You, there's no way to amend it. We don't want to live with it. How are we going to change it? The convention is the, somehow the source by means of which change is going to take place. So what do we do about powers? We've looked at structure. What are we going to do about powers? The answer is to give to Congress the power to do all those things for which the states are incompetent. You say, whoa. And, and who decides whether the states are incompetent? The answer is Congress decides whether the states are incompetent. Um, now that's the Virginia plan. And so scene three is going, if we go back to the four act drama and act one, scene three is the first discussion of the plan. So how do they start at the beginning? They go through each of the resolutions and somebody says, well, yeah, that's nice. And by the time they get to the end, which is on June the 5th of the first go round, it emerges, where do the states fit in? The answer is they don't, or they don't predominantly. So the, Virginia, the essence of the Virginia plan is we need to start all over with a continental-wide government. Well, that is not going to go over either practically or theoretically. Practically, why? Because these delegates are elected by states. And so are they going to go back and say to their state legislatures, guess what we just did? <laughs> so there's a practical question which Solon and Theseus and Moses didn't have to face. <laughs> that is the folks back home. And then there's a theoretical question. That the, the theoretical question is sort of the experiential 
and the philosophical point, is, which is that if you want free government, and we presume, presume that that's what you want, after all, what was the revolution about? If you want free government, history and theory and practice have shown you need small homogeneous communities where people know each other, they look after each other, they look out for each other. That freedom cannot reign among a group of strangers. And it seems, says a couple of delegates, that what Madison is creating is a nation of strangers where, where we don't where we don't know each other, but we do compete with each other. And that leads to scene four. And scene four is where James Madison defends what has come to be known as the extended commercial republic, where we pay our representatives, where commerce is an extremely part, important part of our life where the arts and sciences are to be improved and encouraged, where, where people can improve their own material condition, where liberty is in danger because our neighbor does know what we're doing. I mean, it's almost like making the case for Berkeley over against the case for Redlands and Pepperdine. The, the, I mean, the case against Berkeley and big schools is that no one knows you, you're a number, you're, you're anonymous, and you walk down the street and no one cares. Madison says, thank goodness. The case in favor of Redlands and, Ber and, and, and Pepperdine is that people know you and they care. They bring you cookies when you're sick. They look out for you, they look after you, and they also look, pull the curtain and say, aha. And, they, and, and, and you can't even do a thing by, your, by yourself without someone knowing what it is that you're doing. And Madison says, and that's the stuff of tyranny. Nosy busybodies who can't, who are interested in whether I have a drink after dinner and go gossip about it. That, that, so they've got these two visions. Madison, people are safer, happier, and freer when we spread them out and get them interested in self-governing. And Sherman responds, people are freer and happier in small, homogeneous communities where we know each other, we care about each other, and we're not anonymous uh, scraps of paper. That's the, that's the theoretical argument behind this. So that the, opposite, the theoretical argument against the Virginia plan is we need small scale to be free. The practical argument against the Virginia plan is I can't go back home and tell the state legislatures that we're, we're, we're flushing their state down the Potomac. And so now what do the delegates do? They go through a second go round. So on June, this, on, on, um, it, we've got scene five, second discussion of the Virginia plan. Number seven, number eight, um, and one of the things that becomes controversial is that, um, is that in Madison's Virginia plan, there is a proposal. Go ahead. Yeah. You, you, you're going to embarrass yourself if you just stand there. <laughs> so why don't you come and just sit down and interrupt me? <laughs> Please, welcome. Um, Yeah, one of the controversial aspects of the Virginia plan by Madison is a proposal that if Congress did not like what a state, the state legislature has passed, Congress could veto the state legislature. I mean, well, why would Madison be so insistent on this? The answer is, the Articles of Confederation. And he says, well, I still don't quite understand. The Articles of Confederation, we're in agreement. I mean, are, are you saying that the states aren't pulling their weight? And Madison would say, yeah. Are they embarrassing us overseas with this? Yeah, but you haven't got it. Well, why haven't I not got? Madison would say that the real problem with the Articles is it protects the states. And, well, so? Well, 
what happens is that there are three issues which we need to keep in mind. Issue number one is the states then can pass paper money laws. If they pass paper money laws, that means that debtors can get out of their debts and creditors cannot um, be paid what they're supposed to be paid in, in terms of the contract which was signed. And that creates a controversy. Good! Get Wall Street! And the other side will say, well, why should we invest? Why should capitalism thrive if we aren't get, uh, getting the reward that we agreed to? Well, squelch on your debts! The heck with them! They're you know, rich anyway. They can afford it. Or, well, wait a minute, you can't have, you can't have commerce without obeying contracts. And it was rampant in Virginia that people they passed paper money. So, but, but nothing could be done about it. Why? Because the feds couldn't get involved. So Madison says the feds should get involved in that. It's a matter of the revolutionary principle of I have a right to earn my daily bread. I have a right to the reward for my labor and investment and risk. And if that goes, then the whole commercial basis of a, of a country goes. It depends upon property rights, it depends upon contracts. And property rights and contracts must be defended interstate, not just on a state-by-state -state basis. Because what we want to do is to have a free trade area from New Hampshire all the way down to, to Georgia. Not one state, a tariff, another state, another state, another state. We've got to do that. We've got to federalize it. Well, what else? Madison would say that in Virginia, because there's a majority, they have passed a law which says there has to be an establishment of religion. We want the Anglican Church. And Madison is saying, but that's contrary to the revolutionary principle of liberty, that I have a right to conscience. Well, it's done democratically. A majority says, this is what we want. And Madison says, but there are certain things that the majority shouldn't be able to do. But aren't you advocating anti-democracy, Mr. Madison? And Mr. Madison would respond, well, what I want is a constitutional democracy. Well, what the heck is that? Well, just when the monarch was seeming to be absolute, we tried to constitutionalize the monarch and make the monarch behave. Uh, what's what we want to do? Just because we have won the revolution and we, the people, are in charge, doesn't say that we, the people, can't be ignorant, stupid, prejudiced, tyrannical. So we have to have civic education. Plug, plug. <laughs> but what if the people don't listen? Should they be able to get their way? Aren't the isn't the voice of the people the voice of God? And the answer is no. The voice of God is the voice of the people. Well, aren't these truths, truths self-evident because we agree to them? No, we agree to them because they're true. Not true because we agree to them. That gets too much too complicated for me. But we have to, so Madison's point is that religious freedom requires an ability to stop a state majority from denying the religious freedom of others. This is what the revolution is about. That is something which should go continental. Not everything should go continental, but three vital things should go continental. Property rights, conscience rights, and the third one is certain political rights. In Virginia, uh, the state laws are pa passed um, uh, saying this group of people are being very, very naughty indeed. They're robbing, they're doing this and doing that. What are we going to do about it? Let's pass a law. All right, we'll pass a law which says you can't do this. But we know full well there's only a small group of people who are doing it. And they come from a certain district. Well, that means we're targeting them, isn't it? Yes. Aren't we profiling them? The answer is yes. We're going to get things done. We're going to clean it up. And Madison says, you can't do that. A law must be general and applicable and equally enforced. You cannot keep doing that. But you are, Virginia. That's exactly what you do. So Madison's point about negativing, negating state laws doesn't mean to say that he wants one centralized administration. What it means is that there are certain crucial questions, religious liberty, property rights, and shall we say political procedures, which are so important that we need to have each state abiding by that, rather than, now, marriage, 
let each state decide. Uh, carriage licenses, let each state, state decide. Uh, education, let each state decide. But there are certain things which we cannot let each state decide. And those are the three. And I think that's what Madison has in mind, that, that we cannot live in accordance with the revolution unless we abide by something we, the American people. Is it possible then for us to do two very difficult things? Can we be Americans on certain critical matters and be Virginians on others? How much, how much variety, how much flexibility can we have from one situation to another? That's the American narrative in a, in a nutshell. Um, I mean, prior to the 13th Amendment, excuse me, prior to the 15th Amendment, could African Americans vote? The in instinct is to say no. The an that would be a wrong answer because it depended upon each state. Are you telling me that, that whether an African American could vote depends upon the mere accident of residence? The answer is yes, but it's not an accident. It is a part of what it means to have a federal republic. What the 15th Amendment does is to take that out of the hands of the state. We are now going to continentalize that. Could women vote before the 19th Amendment? The answer is yes. The instinct is to say no. But what it does is to take that out of the hands of the state, because 18 year olds vote. I can go on and on and on and on. The point is that, that part of the American narrative over the last 200 years has been taking away more and more items from the state level because we think that it is an important continental purpose that we are all the same. On the, and this is what the marriage laws on homosexuality and lesbianism right now. Should it be up to each state to decide? Or should there be one national standard? And that's what the re debate is in Act One, is in, in, in terms of that whole question. Well, we get to, we get to the, um, uh, we, we, we get to June the 11th uh, in scene six. And what happens is, is that Sherman has a proposal. He says, you know what, I'm not a, I'm not a very theoretical man, but I understand politics. And it seems to me we can't get rid of the states. But a lot of you guys are concerned that the states can be set free to do naughty things. Let's make a deal. And you have to say, well, to what extent is compromise is compromise part of the normal process, or is this just the mere politicians at work? And Sherman says, look, you have cut the states out from the structure. I propose putting the states in. How? Have the states do the electing of the Senate, and have the states being represented in the Senate. So you have the people in the House, and you have the states in the Senate. Isn't that a reasonable compromise? The articles, the states, no people. Virginia plan, people, no states. Why don't we do a bit of both? That's the American way. And Madison says, give me a reason. And Sherman, in effect, says, it's there. That's not good enough reason. Give me a reason of injustice. God create humans so there are human rights. Humans create states. Where do states' rights come from? Not from God. Boundaries can change. Floods happen. What is the basis for it? And they have a vote. And on that vote, it is, um, it, it's a 6-5 vote in favor of Madison and against Sherman. But that's a very, very close vote. That's not the way that you want to proceed with consensus. And Mr. Dickinson goes up to Mr. Madison and says, Mr. Madison, I mean, and this is Madison's notes. <laughs> he has this. He says, Mr. Madison, this time you went too far. There were people like me who were willing to compromise with you, and you drew the line in the sand, or you drew the red line and say, don't cross this. This is a matter of justice. The state should not be represented. We had a deal. And you insisted on not going by that deal. You know what you've just done, Mr. Madison? You have just wasted two weeks of negotiation. And what was the response? The New Jersey plan. Why, of all of a sudden, two weeks in, 
Do they come up with a New Jersey plan? The answer is, you don't want to play ball? We don't want to play ball. That's it. We will not fund <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But we'll fund the rest of government, but we won't play with this one. Well, are you holding us hostage? You're darn right we are. How about a quorum, too? You might want to, want to walk out on that. But that's not fair. Welcome. You want to go to Solon and live by, by tyranny? Negotiate. Stand up. Stop being crybabies. And uh, so the New Jersey plan is introduced, and what does it say? It says, look, the issue is not structure. There's no problem with the states being equally represented. The problem is power. What we should have is a couple more powers added to Congress. The power to, 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 to tax, which Congress didn't have, and the power to regulate interstate commerce, which Congress did not have. And then go home and forget it. There's a vote on that. And the vote is six to five. And in part of that vote, Hamilton says, I'm going to have my plan. And there's a number of stories as, as we wind up this first session. But one I like, which, it's, it's, and you can like a story not because it's true, but because it's beautiful. Um, the story goes something like this. Americans love the middle ground. And what we have so far is that we have the Articles of Confederation over here. We have the Virginia plan over here. And somehow, the New Jersey plan seems to be in the middle. What we need is something outrageous from somebody as outrageous as Hamilton to go all the way over here and say, I have a plan which will make the Virginia plan look middle. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> but no one changed their mind. So the Hamilton plan did not really have an impact on this conversation. The Hamilton plan has an impact on a subsequent conversation, including number four of his plan, the supreme executive authority of the United States to be vested in a governor, to be elected to serve during good behavior, that means no, no, right, no, no, every four years. And this is why he was called a monarch, by the way, a monarchist. To, uh, to chosen for, for that purpose by the people, and, um, uh, uh, by, by electors chosen by the people. That's the origin of the Electoral College. Um, the authorities and function of the executive to be as follows. To have a negative on all laws about to be passed. That's the presidential veto power. Um, to have the direction of war when authorized or begun. Now, this is Hamilton, supposedly the war powers president, the person who is in favor of the commander in chief, here recognizing in the convention that the president of the United States does not have that kind of authority or didn't want to give him that kind of authority. That the president's commander in chief clause kicks in after. Uh, and the commander-in-chief is to direct the war. It's not to make the war. It's to direct the war when authorized or begun to have with advice and appropriate the power of making all treaties, etc. So that I, 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 I want to return to this because um, each time I try to tailor it to the audience or, the, or some issue that's in the air, it seems to me that one of the issues that's in the air today is the war powers of Congress over against the war powers of the president. And Hamilton is often used as an exemplar of war powers for the president. And I just wanted to throw that out to see uh, whether we could we want to talk about that down, down the line. So the, the, uh, how, does, how does the curtain fall at the end of Act One? The answer is that Madison has won but not completely without a couple of blows. He has lost, um, the, he, he has lost in fact the veto. He's lost a couple of other things. Um, he, he is awfully close to not winning the Senate. And, um, and, and the question now is as the, as the curtain falls and we enter act two, what's the opposition going to do now? Will they accept defeat and work within what they've just done? Or will the opposition mount an alternative? I'll see you in five to ten minutes.